Hi everybody. I'll be starting here shortly. Hi. Is there a way to see how many people are here? Should be a number under the stream. I'm not seeing a number, but I'll take your word for it. I'm probably just overlooking it. Okay, let's get started. Um, so I'm going to talk through a little bit of cross stitch, some basics. Um, some of the terminology, looking at some of the equipment that I use, um, and then we're going to work on this free pattern from uh, DMC. They're a cross-stitch brand um, that has a wide collection of free patterns, um, and I picked the cabbages because I thought it'd be really cute to hang up in my kitchen at some point. Um, and then we can talk about cross-stitch, or if interested, um, I brought out my canning books. Uh, someone mentioned they'd be interested in learning about canning sauerkraut, uh, so I'd happily talk through that as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, um, and I will try and catch them. And we have a wonderful moderator here with us today, too, to help out with that. Okay, so we're going to start actually looking at the, um, this is called Ada Cloth, that's just the brand. Um, and I already have it blocked or um, lined out of how many um, squares I need. So these are blocks of 10, um, and I have the five marks as well. Um, and I use a water-soluble pen, um, so uh, one of the things that you can do when you're blocking is you can either sketch your pattern um, and stitch it that way or draw the lines. And so when you look at the pattern, which we'll look at briefly, um, they're always there. Um, I'm really bad at overcounting or undercounting, and so this helps me um, because if I don't do this, then I have to um, rip out a lot of thread and start over. Um, there's another... Um, thing you can do is I've seen some people they'll use a contrast color and stitch these lines and they'll go like up and down under and over like every five or ten marks um, I did that for a piece recently uh, but it was a piece that was like full flooded of color and that took quite a while to take all those stitches out um, so that would be my only caveat with doing that um, but the pin is just a water soluble pin you can get it at a craft store um, and it's just like a nice little basic felt tip um, nothing to it. Um, they can dry out really easily, so that's like my main caveat of why I don't like them, um, but it's not that bad. Uh, and to just show how that works, I'm just going to pull up a video here of um, using a water-soluble marker. Um, so this is a pattern that I made um, a couple of Christmases ago for my brother-in-law and his wife. Um, and I'm just putting uh, warm water in the sink with some dish soap to help wash all the oils off. Uh, but you can see it's got that water soluble pin. Um, and then once it's fully submerged, all the blue will just disappear. And it's all gone. So that way it won't leave any marks on your stitching. Um, and then you just rinse it out and iron it, lay it flat, and you're good to go. Um, I've seen other people use like heat er erasable pins. Um, so they're pins like these here, but they're, they're a friction pin. Um, if you can see that, they have an eraser on them. Um, I am a little hesitant with these um, because if you use these and you live in a climate where it gets really cold and really hot, they'll come back onto the paper um, or onto your, um, onto your pattern. So if you live somewhere that's either not super hot or uh, has like temperature differences so like you can write but then um, using the friction of the eraser 
it'll erase them um, for the most part. You can't see it, but if this gets cold again, let me try and see if I can blow on it. It'll make the color come back. Okay, that didn't work, but it does happen on the, the, the cross stitch fabric. I've had issues um, with it. So if it's not a problem and you're doing like a full fill, it's okay. But if you have parts that'll have like blank spaces, that's when I'm, I'm a little cautious with using these pins. Um, some other things, so this is eight o'clock 14. And so what that means is there are 14 um, holes per, per inch. Um, so you can use a ruler to help block these off for you. Um, and this varies, I've seen Ada up to like 11 or 10 and then it can go as many as like 28 so that'd be a really small like intricate pattern i like using 8 to 14 uh because i am visually impaired most of the time um and so using um something larger that i can see helps me out but there's 14 squares per inch so that would be from for instance can go a little lower so this line here to here is 14 stitches and as one full inch so as you're planning your projects, that's really helpful to know. Um, so some other things, there are embroidery hoops. Uh, people always also use them for quilting, so they can be quilt hoops. And these come in a ton of different sizes. They have like really, really tiny ones, or they have like massive ones that you can use. Um, and they usually have this uh, vice clip here that you can tighten or loosen over your fabric. And so people use these in the hoop in a variety of different ways. So you can put it to where this extra hoop will go under your fabric. So it would look something like this. Oh, and Makerspace has hoops too, which is really great. Um, I found a bunch of mine at um, the Scrap Exchange in Durham. Um, I don't know if they're open right now during the pandemic, but they have um, a ton when I went. And so um, this you can see now, there's part of the pattern in the bottom of this hoop as well as in the top. Um, this is how I stitch, but I also know people that they'll, they'll call this and they'll say they stitch in the ditch because it's basically a, a ditch here. Um, I don't do this. It feels strange to me because I've never done it, but um, if it's what you like, it's what you like, and that's honestly all that matters when it comes to cross stitch. I'm gonna take this out for now. And then a couple other uh, really helpful tips is when you buy um, thread for this, it's usually a six strand thread. And so this is from DMC, that's one of those brands I was talking about. Um, and then on these labels, it'll usually tell you a color code. So this is white and they use Blanc. Um, DMC is a, a brand out of Montreal, so their stuff is in English and in French. Um, but a couple of other things that are really beneficial on these labels is, let me make sure it'll focus. see. Um, so it tells you uh, washing instructions, which is really helpful if you put these on clothes. Um, but there's this first set of arrow here. It's a gold and black arrow, one points up, one points down. So that's really helpful when you go to use this thread. Each package will have it, each little strand of thread. Um, I wasn't sure if it was going to focus on this one. You can see there's that arrow right here. What this means is when you unwind your thread, that's the direction you wanna pull this thread. So that way, um, cause there's gonna be a tail here and there's usually one somewhere under this um, smaller label. Um, but by pulling on this one to unwrap or use thread, it'll help it not tangle. Um, and I've spent many hours untangling uh, this type of thread. So any um, help is useful. And then I like to put mine on these little um, like thimbles um, and you just wrap it around. It'll look uh, something like this. And then I write the number of the uh, color because DMC classifies all their uh, colors as different numbers. So for instance, uh, this is 30 or 3814 um, and that corresponds to like this shade of green. Um, and they have them all in very specific ways. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and wind this white one. I've seen people do some really cool hacks with like uh, using a electric drill and attaching it with a binder clip and just turning it and letting it letting it run. Um, I'm afraid to do that in that it'll get tangled and it'll be a, 
a bigger mess for me. And then uh, DMC also has like little winders that are just like a little stitch that holds this and it spins it for you and you just hold the thread. Um, I just do it by hand because I don't, I don't cross stitch like massive projects that would need me to wind a ton of things at a time. Um, and I honestly just find this a little bit therapeutic of just going through it. Um, oh yeah, and I think uh, we got linked to a um, 3D printer version of it, which is really cool. They have them like, on Amazon. I don't shop on Amazon, but they have them for like like two or three dollars. Uh, but if we could 3D print them for you, that would also be really helpful. So while I'm winding this, I'm gonna go through a couple other um, cross stitches that I have made just to go over just some ideas. Uh, so this was my very first cross stitch. Um, it's a Ritsuko uh, rage pattern. Um, it's just a like 3D, I'm not a 3D, just a pixelated image that I turned into a cross stitch. Um, but I wanted to point out this one because if you'll see here on this, you'll notice that these threads go in different directions. So some are uh, forward leaning, some are backward leaning. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, some people will suggest that you do all of your stitches the same direction because it adds a like smoothness to your pattern. So you can kind of see this one looks uh, textured and wavy. Um, but on this one here, this is one that I have them all in the same texture. And then I also included the back because that's very fun to look at sometimes. And then here's that one that I showed getting washed and that's what the back of it looks like. Um, and this was my most recent one, and you can see the back of it's a bit more of a mess, which is okay. It doesn't have to be um, super pretty. The back of it's always, for me, the, the fun part that I really like to um, look at and take photos of as often as I can. Um, but for today, we're using a DMC pattern. Um, it's a website that um, you can buy your thread here, your yarn, uh, anything like that. Uh, but I like it because they have free patterns. Um, I really enjoy free patterns. So you can go to your cross stitch and it's got um, a wide variety of really anything. Uh, these are all free. Uh, you do have to give your email and get a newsletter, um, but you can give a, a fake email and a, it'll still give it to you. Um, but they have a ton of different designs that you're interested in, uh, if you could be. And then I, uh, chose the cabbage which is under food and drinks. I'm also really interested in this tomato one. The peppers are also very cute. Uh, but for today we're going to be using this cabbage pattern. Um, and I already have it downloaded, uh, but what DMC will do for you is they'll also tell you what thread you need, um, which is really helpful uh, if you're shopping on like joannes.com or like Michael's online. Um, it doesn't have as, as helpful as a search interface, so it does take a little bit more time if you're unable to go in person. Uh, but then we're just going to look at the pattern and go through a couple things. Let me check the chat. Okay. Um, so this is the pattern. Uh, this is the overall, the different colors um, and the different shapes that you'll make. Um, there's those lines and each box of colors pointing to it. I don't know if we'll get to that today, but that is the back stitching. Um, it's used to just add an additional texture and dimension to your, your cross stitches. Um, they're definitely optional um, and uh, usually pretty simple to do, um, but they can be really intimidating if you've worked on a really great project um, and you're worried you're going to mess it up because that's how I am. Uh, but some other things to look at this pattern, most others will be very similar and it'll have a grid for you. Um, it has these arrows to indicate where the center of your pattern will be. Um, so this is an 80 by 80 square. And so they have the middle 40s all marked off. I'm just gonna go to your next page. And this will be the pattern in a diagram format. And so this is, I'm gonna zoom in really closely so you can see it. Um, so they have coordinated each color to have a symbol, um, which is a little bit easier to um, do as you're making this cross stitch because it's a bunch of different shades of green and just going off of that original image it's a little harder to differentiate which green is the correct green and so they use all of these different symbols uh, for the colors um, which is a little stressful for me so I have uh, this image cropped in several different ways on my iPad um, just so I can follow it a little bit better 
And then on this next page, they tell you what tools you'll need. Um, and you see that they're in English and French, so A to 14, which is what we have. Your embroidery hoop is optional, you can stitch without it. And then scissors just to cut your um, to cut your fabric. It gives you the size and inches that it'll be. And they talk about uh, the fabric count or the ADA, but since we're using 14 count, um, and they talk about that um, with what you're interested in. And then on the final page, this will be the most important page, is it tells you the colors that you'll use. Um, and so you'll see there's all these symbols very similar to our, our pattern that had those. And so we'll see that we'll use for these side carrots, we'll use this green. Um, and it just has that full list. There's, I think there's 18, 19 colors. So it does get a little uh, confusing and difficult. And then it also shows you how many strands to use. And I'll show you uh, what that means momentarily. Um, but it also will show you the direction that you want to have all of your stitches leaning. So your initial stitch will lean to the right and then your cover stitch will lean to the left, which I'll show you. Yes, that is exactly why um, wingdings exist um, for no other reason. I usually try to like um, transcribe my patterns onto Excel sheets because uh, I can put counts in if I need to. Uh, I didn't do that for this one just because of all the different colors and I was worried I wouldn't have it done in enough time. I had a piece of thread already cut to show you all what it would look like. And now I don't know where to put it. One moment. Well then, I already cut. It's okay, I'll cut some more. I don't know where I put it. So we're going to start with the 712 in our pattern, but we will need this here. Let me readjust this so it looks at what we want it to look at. One moment. Sorry if this will make you um, motion sick. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to start on the broccoli because uh, I think it's really cute. sure that that is center for you all. Okay. The most part is in there. How does that look? Perfect. So this is what we're going to start with. We're going to use that 712. And so based on our pattern, 712, oh, we won't be using 712, apologies. We're gonna use the 3865, which is this white-ish color here. And these are the arrows. No, these are the wrong arrows. There's two types of arrows, and that's probably not good um, user experience choices. Because we need the up arrows, and not the side arrows. So the up arrows, is 164, which is what we use for the top of the broccoli. Okay, so I'm just gonna pull some of this off. I'm gonna cut it. Um, there's not really a set way to determine how long your string should be when you cut it. Um, if you're just starting out, I would start on a shorter thread just so you don't get tangled. Um, and then um, as you go, you can change it. That's what I, I tried to convert the pattern to letters, um, but I got a little cross-eyed, which is normally what I do. So that way I don't have to look at symbols, especially, I don't understand why they'd use the same type of arrow over and over again, but that's okay. Uh, I'm just gonna get a, a different color for some contrast. So um, you have your embroidery thread and it has six strands. You have six strands here, and our pattern called for us to use two of these. So um, this is where things can get tangled. You can separate them all like that and pull them apart. I've seen some people, um, which I think is very witchcraft-esque, is they'll just take this top and they'll pat it to separate it out. And they'll take two strands and pull them straight up. 
Um, but I always get tangles down at the bottom, so I don't do that. Um, but if you do that and you have advice on not getting tangled, let me know. Um, but I just slowly pull it apart. So we have our two strands now. But what'll be great is this long piece will give us three different um, sets of stitching. So like we'll be able to use it three times, um, which is how one, um, one skein or one little hoop of, of yarn is, uh, or thread is really helpful. I'm gonna put those other two aside. Take out this contrast. Okay, so we're doing the broccoli, and that one actually starts um, in the 10 block and in the 20 block. So we'll want to use this set of 10 block. We're going to go down to the 20, and it starts here, and it goes in this direction. So I have a different hoop because it's a little smaller, and it'll be easier for me to focus. Um, but embroidery hoops come in all sorts of sizes and colors. You can get squares or ovals or anything like that. Uh, these plastic ones have a groove, um, and I like these when I'm working on smaller projects because it holds everything in place really well. So we're going to start right about here. So this would be the 10s and then the 20s. Um, it's very much like um, Battleship when I when I think about uh, putting these and like figuring out where the patterns go. I feel like I'm just I'm going to start my stitch in like B5, A5, um, also very like chess-like or cartography-like. Um, and then you can tighten it or loosen it. I'm gonna loosen it a little bit more so it just pops right over. And then once you have it where you need it, you just tighten it up. Um, they also have things called Q snaps. Um, I don't know why they're called Q because they don't shape in a Q, but it's PVC pipe. And what that is, it just like clips onto the side with little hooks. Um, and if you're working on like larger projects, it's really helpful. Um, and then there's also like squirrels and you can put, uh, and the hoop just makes a handle. Yeah, so you can just hold on to it here. Some people will keep them on the embroidery hoops when they're done and use it to hang. Uh, the plastic ones I don't, uh, just cause they don't, uh, to me, I don't like the aesthetic of them hanging, but people will use these like wooden ones for the hanging aspect of it. Um, so they look really nice and cute. Um, and then there's also products that I've seen where people will put like a, like those steering wheel looking covers over these, um, which is really cool. So that way the edges don't get dirty. Um, if you're working on a project that's gonna take a long time, you can just roll it up and put that fabric over it to help you hold it. Um, but since this is gonna be a really small project, it's not gonna be um, that important. Okay, so I'm going to now thread my needle. If I can find my needle box. One moment. Right here. I'm working on another project and I think my needle box is consumed with that project. But I have backup needles. You hear me rustling inside of a just a little sh plastic shoe box while I find these needles. So for these, you can, for when you cross stitch, you can use um, sewing needles, uh, but just be really careful with how sharp they are. Um, there are specific like cross stitch and embroidery needles that don't have a point and they work more um, like a tapestry needle. I like using those because then I don't stab myself um, over and over again. But these are some uh, DMC needles uh, that I got as a gift. They're gold plated, so I'm told that they slide smoother. Um, I have not tested them to find that out, but we will check that now. Um, I'll also say I typically have clammy hands, and so I sometimes struggle with needles in general, uh, just because they are so hard to pull out. Well, this being that example. There we go. And so these needles have a point be something for me to remember as I do this. And so there's a couple of different ways that you can start your cross stitch. Um, if you uh, are into sewing or anything like that, one way is you can thread your needle and then put
put it all as a loop so you'll thread it so that way your needle is at the bottom and your ends are here at the top and you can tie it off and then start your cross stitch. I um, start mine a little bit differently so that way my back is, the back side of my cross stitch is smoother. I'll put my contrast back here so you can see a little bit better. So I start with my ends of my thread together. Apologies if it's not focusing. And I put all four ends um, together them through the needle eye. Apologies for not having that on camera. I have to get close to it so I can see it. I'm missing two through it. And then you can use um, some beeswax uh, to, th to smooth out your thread if you need to. Um, if it's a project for me, I'll just use some like chapstick that I have lying around and just rub it on the ends. Um, but if it's for somebody else, I'll use a specific wax. Um, but so what I've done now is I've pulled those ends. So this is all four ends of it through this hoop. So the be loose ends here, but then I'll have my loop down here at the bottom. If you can see that. So this is the loop of the thread. And so what I'm going to do Let's see, so I start 10, 20, and over four. Okay, so if I start over here in the 20s, so this is 10, and then it goes down the top of those. Is that six, I think? One, two, three, four, five, six, yep. So we have one, two, three, four, five. So that's one, two, three, four, five, and then this will be six, but we start three off of this. So that's one, two, three. Okay. So one of, so since we're starting this, what we're going to do is we're going to pull it slightly through here. We're not going to pull it all the way. We still have that hoop in the back and you're going to put your diagonal. I think this is the opposite direction that it has it, but it's all preference. So I'm going to put it through that diagonal box here. So you always go from the point that you start to the diagonal below it. And we're going to put that, we're not going to pull it all the way through, but you can see it's kind of taut. But then you have your back here and you have this loop that we created. Okay. And we're going to put the needle through that loop because then and then you're just going to pull it tight. This can tangle up sometimes, so just take your time. And now we've started our cross stitch and there's no knot. And so if you're going to frame this um, or anything like that, you don't have to worry about a knot. But also as you're finishing, the use of this specific thread um, is also really helpful for what we're going to do. But this way you don't have like knots hanging around and as you add more thread, it won't add a, a, another bump to it. Um, I, I haven't learned a lot of like technical things in cross stitch, but I saw this one thing on YouTube once and it changed my life. So I try to share it with everybody as often as I can. Okay. So we've got our first one here. If it's gonna focus, perfect. Okay, so we have four of these stitches of this, what is this, 164. So we're just gonna go through, make those loops. Here. And um, what I do is I try to do all one direction of stitches at a time in a pattern. I know some people who um, will start in the middle of the pattern and work outwards. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong way, it's just preference on how you want to do the pattern. Um, I picked this to just do one vegetable at a time. Uh, just because they all change colors so often, it's just going to be easier for me. And then for that next row, it goes out, what is that, four over, one, two, three, four, from this bottom. And so what I'll do, put this up here, is I'll count, um, so we need four over, and so this here would be our, it's really hard to see, so I apologize. So this will be one, 
and we'll go over four, which looks like it's right on that five line that I have drawn, which will be really helpful. So that's, yeah, one, uh, two, three, four, five. And since this will be, since I'm going this way, I'm gonna go this way now. And so I'll start at the bottom of this. This is just one of those like preference things that I do. Um, so that way I don't have to like back stitch going the other direction, if that makes any sense. I'll show you real quick. And so it's still, oh, you can see what I, I did something wrong there. I didn't put my stitch in the right place. Um, and so when I do this, I pull my thread so it is a little farther away from where I need to refeed my needle. Um, and this mistake is easier to make when there's not as many stitches on the in the hoop. Um, but I'll just pull it usually right back and it'll start me back at where I was. We need it to go diagonal. So I'm gonna pull that back through. Yep. And so I go in the opposite direction from, from the bottom to the top left when I'm going uh, from right to left because if I go from left to right, like I started on that top row, um, I have to back stitch each time. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like on the back of my pattern, or back of my Ada cloth here in a second. I'll go through this one. I will say these gold needles do go through the Ada cloth a lot smoother than like regular needles. Um, so I can focus. Perfect, okay, so just to show what the back looks like. So you can see my top row, um, they look up and down, um, but since I'm, there'll be this long stitch here, so that's where I took this one to this one. And because I'm doing it from top to bottom and then moving back over top to bottom, it creates these longer patterns of thread and uses more um, embroidery floss. Uh, once again, this is just a preference thing. It helps save floss, but um, I also won't get tangled in this as I keep adding more colors or stitches. So I'm going to switch back to my other technique uh, from going to the bottom right to the top left just to show a couple more of what that looks like. Work through a couple of these. Okay. And this goes all the way five and then six. So we did our five stitches and now we're gonna go through the other six. I have seen people who are able to just like do this and not look and count um, and I am in awe of all of those people because I feel like I'm constantly like recounting and counting and recounting. Um, whereas, um, so I'm, I'm a knitter and a and a crocheter. So this is the second row at the very top of the broccoli. Yes. Um, so I'm a, I'm a knitter and a crocheter and I can do a lot of my patterns that way without like looking and counting just because I'm so used to it. Uh, but when it comes to these I have to count um, each and every little mark that I do. Um, so one, two, three, four. And then we'll do five and six and I'll show you the back of this to show how the difference um, from going bottom left or bottom right to top left as opposed to top left to bottom right each time. So um, the first set I did from the uh, top to the bottom on this bottom row is it added these extra spaces but now since I um, did them bottom to top. You can see my stitches go similar um, to that top row. And so that's just a, it's just an aesthetics thing. There's really no right or wrong, um, but it's just how I like it. And then uh, because this is how much thread I have left, I'm going to go ahead and cross stitch back over all of these. And so to do that, you mirror what you did on the top. So for these, I'm going to do bottom uh, left to top right. Just go over it, and that'll create that full solid square for us. Perfect. So 
I'm just going to go across all those here. Okay. So while I do this, um, I told um, our moderator that I was working on uh, cabbages and um, was interested in making sauerkraut. Um, I pulled out uh, my old canning book um, uh, that my mom gave me that uh, we got from one of my great aunts. Um, it's from the 70s. It's just like this really nice old canning book um, that has some really great recipes and talks about the type of equipment that you need. Because um, I, I grew up canning um, a lot. We lived on the, a very small farm. Uh, but we would can things like tomatoes and green beans. Uh, we did chow chow, which is, um, if you don't know, it's it's very similar to sauerkraut, uh, but it has corn in it and a couple of other things, depending on your preference. Um, and we would make pickled squash and uh, canned sauerkraut. And um, for the longest time, I did not like green beans because... After green bean harvest, um, obviously my parents worked during the day, and so I was at home all day um, popping and stringing beans, green beans, runner beans, and so those are the like their beans in that string, and then they have those little knobs on each end. One part is where it connects to the plant, and the other one is uh, just how it grows. And I would have to pull each of those strings off each side, and then snap each of the beans at every joint. Um, and as like a 14 year old doing that in the summer by yourself for like eight hours is not um, fun at all. And so that was just one of those like I just held that in contentment for so long. Um, okay, so I just did something that I can show you. So my thread actually pulled out of my needle because it's getting so short here, um, which happens. We have a couple more stitches left, but we're just going to skip on those. And so I have this tail here. It, it was a very long board job, um, but I'm glad I did it because I learned how to can, even though I didn't like it. Um, and now I love green beans. I, I, for a while, was eating them every day, all the time. So um, I think they're delicious, and I'm, I'm mad I spent so much of my life just resenting them. Um, and this is when re-threading the needle can get really hard. So because my hands are started to get clammy. So when this happens and I can't re-thread the needle that well uh, because the ends have gotten frayed, I'll just snip it with some scissors. Um, my go-to recipe for green beans is I will um, put them on a sheet tray with a little bit of olive oil and then I'll do either fresh garlic if I have any um, or garlic powder and then some onion powder and salt and pepper and then I really love smoked paprika um, and then I'll just put that over it and then roast them for about 10 to 15 minutes because uh, I still want them with that really good crunch um, and then just make for like some really great snacks. I'm gonna take this off screen so I can bring this closer to me. Okay so I have re-threaded this um, and then so now that we have this extra piece that we can't really keep stitching, uh, we're going to lock it in place or secure it. Um, and I might take it out of the hoop so I have more room for my hands to show you this. Just to take that off. So to do this part, you can tie a knot um, at the end of it and just tie it off and that's fine. Um, this is all preference, but what I will do is I will backtrace my needle through these stitches. Um, so I will start as far back as I can without unthreading my needle, I just rethreaded, And then I will work it through the back of these loops. So I'm just going to push that through right now. You can do as many as you want. Uh, my thread is not as long, so it's a little less forgiving right now. Um, but you just slide it through this. And then I'm just gonna rotate this so I can pull it. And you pull your thread through. Um, this is where the clammy hands comes in, it was a problem. Um, I do have these like little thimbles that go on my hands to help out. I'm just gonna use my mouse pad, actually. I'm 
it's a very similar texture, but you pull it through. I apologize for not being able to see that. And it lays just right in these stitches. Let's see what this is. So it's now secured in place, and I'll just trim this tail. And so it keeps things on the back really flat. So if you're framing a cross stitch, this is like a really helpful, um, really helpful work around to keep it flat as you put it in a frame, because sometimes they're a little hard to put in frames. But also, as you continue to stitch, it doesn't get caught in your other stitches. Um, if you're using the same color, um, it's not as bad, but if you're using other colors and you poke through, it'll like bleed in other colors. So like you'll have like grays or blacks or whatever other color you're working with. Okay. Um, let's put it, I'm gonna put it in that wooden hoop because it's a little bit bigger for me to see and show you all. Okay. And growing up when we would can sauerkraut. I'm not a, I don't eat sauerkraut. Um, I haven't tried it since I was younger, but I didn't look like it then. Um, but I might like it now. I do enjoy kimchi, so I imagine I would like sauerkraut. Um, but I haven't tried any in the more recent years. Um, but one of the things with sauerkraut is, um, the old wives' tales of following, um, the almanac. Um, and so you want to make sure that your signs are in the correct um, season, if that makes sense. So for instance, um, and you can get this on like a farmer's almanac calendar, um, or you can read the almanacs. Um, I'm not sure if the book I have talks about the almanac signs. Let me check real quick, because that would be really helpful if it did. Um, but basically what this, what it means is that, um, sometimes the signs are either like in the head or the signs are in the bowels and um, if you start canning while the signs are in the bowels um, it will make things and this is probably all old wives tales and not true at all um, so take it all with a grain of salt but um, it would cause your sauerkraut to like ruin and like uh, ferment in a weird way and not turn out well and I'm not sure what the, the reasoning behind it is or if it if there's like any science to it um, but that's how it would do uh, growing up to, to make sure things are, are done correctly. Yeah, it was always um, very interesting to, to like learn and be like, well, we don't have our calendar. We'll need to get the calendar. Um, but the way that um, we would can the sauerkraut is we would spend what felt like days and days and days just like chopping cabbages up to like really fine strips. If you've used um, that like the the coconut that comes in in those bags it's like a very similar texture um and what you'll do is um you shred that up real real fine and thin and you uh can cook it down a little bit um in a massive like uh, pressure cooker if that's what you want to use and then we would put it in a crock uh very similar to like a, like a butter churn jar and we would cover it with cheesecloth and you would just leave it. Uh, we had a can house, so it was just like a, a cool temperature, um, just like a little um, shed that was built into the side of the, um, the like mountain where we lived. So that way it was like a cool and dry temperature um, while the cabbage started to ferment and sour. So you would have sauerkraut. Um, but you'd have to check it like every so often. Um, and the smell as it was essentially souring was always something that um, you don't forget. It is a smell you know for life, <laughs> um, but it's really worth it when you get a really good product. Um, the same is with uh, when we would pickle squash. Um, I'm not sure it, it's, it would be a lot of fun because you would just spend all day using a mandolin or it's like the slicer that's um, it's like about this size and it has a blade and you can run your, uh, fruit over it and it'll cut it the same size over and over. And so we would use the mandolin to cut the squash so you wouldn't have to do it by hand. Um, and it would just be, the house would just reek of vinegar at all hours. And it's already summer, so it's like really, really hot vinegar. Um, but it was always a really great time. 
um, because it would dye our ladles and utensils this really, really great, um, like, 70s greenish yellow. Um, and it would stain it so that you would never be able to use it for anything but that. Um, but it was always a lot of fun to do that. That was another one that I never ate as a child. Um, but I bet I would love it now. Um, but we had talked about doing a canning stream at some point. Um, but I personally internally don't have a kitchen that I trust to can in. Uh, we have one of those glass top stoves. Um, not, not right now. I don't do any canning. We have a glass top stove and I'm afraid to heat up the pans that we have to cook in to cook things down on a glass stove. Uh, I don't want it to crack. And that's just like a, like a weird, um, superstitious fear that I have, um, that it'll crack and break. And then I'll owe my, my landlord a brand new stove. Um, but uh, once I live in a house that doesn't have those glass top stoves, I'll definitely be canning again. One of my favorite things is canned tomato juice. Um, a meal growing up, like a very basic uh, meal, was just like macaroni noodles and tomato juice. Um, I don't know why we started eating it, uh, but we did. It's a really good comfort meal for me. And so I, I, it just doesn't taste the same when you buy it, like at the grocery store in a jar. Um, so I just... I try to ration it because um, my uh, my mom will can them, and then when I go see her on the holidays, I will get um, I will get cans from her. But due to COVID, I didn't get to go this year, so I still have one jar, and I'm just holding out when I really, really need a comfort meal. Um, but what I like about canning tomatoes, um, it is like a it's a long, long process. Um, but usually, you'll can with the Roma tomatoes. And those are the ones that are more like egg shaped. And so one of the things that you can do is you can score the bottom of them. So for instance, I'll use, I, have a, I have a wooden spoon sitting here, don't, uh, it's just cause, so it'll be shaped like an egg and you'll put an X on the bottom of the tomato and then you'll put it in a like massive saucepan uh, and you'll cook it down for an hour or so and then you'll take them all out of the pot and they'll peel off really easily because you've scored the bottom. And then as you um, continue, you can put them in what's called a food mill. Um, it's like a strainer, like a colander that people use. Um, it's just got a crank on it and then it has like this colander bottom and then it also has this like really tiny um, like needle on the bottom that helps scrape the bottom as um, you're obviously running tomatoes through it so you're getting seeds and pulp and that will help you do it. Um, and then once you have all of your tomato juice grinded out, you cook it down some more. You add in your canning salt, which helps with preserving. Um, you bring it to a boil and then you will put it in your sanitized jars. Um, yes, also called the, the, the rotary mill. But you'll put it in your sanitized jars with your new um, lids and rings so um, if you've not seen a canning jar they'll have the, the ring of the jar and then there's a lid or a flat and these come separate um, your rings can be reused uh, but your flats cannot um, because they have a seal on them and so once they've heat sealed it's advised to not use it because then you can um, potentially get things like botulism if that seal is broken um, or it can cause your mold, like can, can cause mold to grow in yours. Um, so rings you can use over and over again as long as there's no rust. Um, but yeah, and you'll uh, sanitize those. And the way we did that growing up is we would just cook the jars in the oven at like 300 degrees. So that way they stayed in there nice and hot. And then we would boil the, the rings and the, the, the lids or the flats in water and then uh, take them out of the boiling water as we needed them, just to keep everything sanitized. And then you would fill up your jars. Um, you would burp them or make sure that there's no air bubbles, which also can lead to um, botulism, which is more found in like green beans and things like that. Um, and then you put your flat part of the lid on and you put your ring on and then you wait and the jars will pop. They'll have this like, um, you know when you're like opening a jar and that popping sound? It's very similar in canning, except as opposed to the lid popping off, 
it actually seals the can, so it, it, it creates that vacuum seal to keep everything like nice and preserved. Um, and then if your jar doesn't seal, um, you'll either have to eat the product that's in it right away or throw it away because then it's um, it can cause um, potential other like foodborne illnesses or it would cause it to sour and um, that would lead to potential health issues and we don't want that. Um, but yes, so uh, they linked a government document of canning. Um, we actually have a really great food science department here at NC State. Um, and they have a food science lab on campus. And so they'll look at all sorts of things, but um, preserving foods is one of them. And then um, NC State is a land grant institution. And so one of the missions of that is that we serve the community of North Carolina through Cooperative Extension. And this is an office that runs out of the CALS department as well as some in natural resources and some in the College of Sciences. And these are people who are in the community um, taking the research that people are doing at NC State and making sure the community has access to it. Um, and one of those within the family and consumer sciences is they will run canning demos. Um, it's done in person um, outside of COVID, uh, but during COVID they're done uh, remote and online um, through the cooperative extension. And then we have a couple of people at NC State who do research on canning and food preservation and things like that. Um, Dr. Ben Chapman is one of them. Um, and he also has a podcast on like ferment on um, fermenting foods and um, food preservation. It's really fascinating. Um, but if you're interested in uh, documents like that, um, if you go to content, so C O N T E N T dot C E S dot N C S U dot E D U, um, these are all the publications done through our cooperative extension people. And so it has things like um, gardening in, their, in our area, um, chemical indices for farmers. Um, it has things like invasive species and how to handle them. Uh, they have a lot of work on um, COVID and how that affects the, the food process from farm to table. Um, they also have really great uh, resources on how to like make a pollinator garden. Um, and all sorts of like bugs that you'll find here in North Carolina. Um, it's really a, a wealth of resources that um, we have here through them at NC State. Yes, the USDA guide, that's what I have uh, back when it was in print. So this is what mine looks like. It's the, the guide, it was bought for a dollar, uh, but it sold for 250. Um, and they have just like some, they also still offer this in print if someone wanted it. Um, but this one was printed in uh, 73 and it has some, such some really great um, graphics for you if you're interested in it. I'm sure the, the one that um, is linked, but it'll show you like how to make your jam with powdered pectin, which is how you get your jam to, um, to solidify. And then, um, so we got this from my great aunt, which was really exciting because I found, as I was looking through this the other day, um, I found one of her like written recipes on how to can some stuff that she got from Ingrid um, and how to make pepper relish and how to can cucumbers so you get pickles. Um, and so I'm gonna scan this later this week so I get to keep it because it's gotten some like water damage and stuff. Um, but just have some really great recipes um, that I'm excited for. But yeah, this is a, I'm really excited to potentially have a house that has a stove that I can can on. Um, but yeah, so this shows you um, of the green beans that I was talking about. Um, they cut them. I snapped them all by hand. Um, that was probably, I probably should have cut them thinking back on it now, but that's okay. Um, but they also have stuff on like how to can meats. If you eat meat, that's really helpful. Um, and how to can um, different fruits and vegetables. Um, I'm really excited that there's this continued push to um, do preserves at home. And I think um, with COVID and everyone being home, it's definitely been a more of a push, especially with people doing like sourdough starters, um, and things like that. Um, but here's what I was talking about with the canning lids. And so, let that focus. So you have this metal ring and there's a hole 
and you have the lid that has that sealing compound and then the lid. And then there are jars that have a complete full lid but have a rubber sealer. Um, that's just a, a preference on what you want for canning, but it's really cool. And this has some like really great Q and A's of like what to do if something is lost during it. What have like, why do certain things float? Um, just some like really good triage questions, which I think is helpful and missing from a lot of other like cookbooks and things like that of today. Um, so we didn't get too, too far into the cross stitch. I will keep working on this and I will, um, share it with our streaming people and then we can get um get that shared i know i think there's going to be some more streams later this semester but eventually this will make one really nice broccoli and then i'll have space for all the other ones um, but does anyone have any questions sorry oh no i don't mind being distracted with canning questions it helps me um focus on getting back into it But also I knew this was going to take a while based on how all the colors of the pattern here that we have um, changes all the time. I knew it was this one's gonna be a, a longer one for me. Um, patterns that have more solid colors are a little bit easier. Um, so for instance, let's go back to those DMCs real quick. Um, so another free one that I have for later use. Okay, pop up ad, thank you. Um, let's uncheck this one. I'm um, going to animals. Okay, kind of scroll. So apologies if people have motion issues. Is this snake here that I plan on doing? Um, and it doesn't change colors as much. You can see it only has five colors, six colors. So it has seven colors, but um, you only use some of them in very minute areas. So like the oranges alternate. So you have like a good shading. Um, so like things like this wouldn't take as long as the one we're working on now. Um, if you are interested in those, but yeah, cross stitch can be a lot of fun. Um, you can take pixelated images or like, like a coloring page. Um, that a lot of like applications do now. I'll see if I can show you the um, Retsuko pattern that I have that I did. Um, let's see, because it was just a, a coloring page. This might not show very well, but it was just a coloring page let's see. Um, that I just can. I took this to Joann's and I looked at all the colors and I just matched them and just made it from pixel. It was like a, a color by number art page. Um, so really you can make anything into cross stitch. That's really cool. Um, there's some fun snarky ones that people use if that's what you're uh, interested in. I know some people really enjoy those and think they're fun. Um, but yeah, there's the sneak pattern. Uh, but we are at time, so I'm happy to hang around and ask any questions. Um, and otherwise, you'll have to tune in to some other streams that we do that you can find on the Twitch page. You can also find it on our NCSU page if you are interested. All right. So that'll be all I have. Thank you, and I hope you have a calm afternoon.